And now to the talk, State of the Accessibility. Uh, our speaker is Beta Lars, an autistic 3D artist. And he's also working in, with Blender. Welcome to State of the Accessibility. I am Metalas at Beta Lars. And what I use in real life is noise cancelling headphones. Technology has improved many things in the last couple of years. But some things are not good enough. This is the outline of the talk. We start with a rough overview. We will look at the different types of disabilities. We will also discuss how accessible the web currently is. I will give you a bit of advice on what you can do as a regular user. And I also want to give you some advice on what you can do as a developer. But first of all, a bit of content notes. I will talk about the pandemic, pandemic, but in a positive context. I will also talk about barriers and ableism, and also about problems with mental health and negative self-images. So what was new in 2020, 2021? Well, we got a pandemic and everyone couldn't go outside. And suddenly a lot of things that were previously offline are now happening online. And that had many advantages for people with disabilities. So if you are out of spoons, then you can just shut down the laptop and you are already at home. You are not required to travel anywhere. And it's a lot easier to participate when you are only required to be at home in front of your laptop. It is also easier to be stealthy, to not appear in public as a disabled person. And of course, you can also participate from your bed at home. And therefore, therefore, online events are less have less barriers than online events. Not all of them, but many online events are more accessible than offline events. And I'm really happy that the current Congress is online. And I hope that there will be future remote chaos experiences that are equally uh, positioned as the offline event in the future. So that uh, people are also able to participate online. And my big wish for the future is that we should maintain these online spaces because they make it easier for people with disabilities to participate. I want to do a little excursion about the spoon theory. So what is a spoon? A spoon is an unspecific unit for social energy. 
People with disabilities have on average less spoons than people without disabilities. And there's also the expanded uh, spoon fury, which includes forks and knives. But spoons are basically an energy of, of a, a unit of energy, and people have different amounts of spoons. And depending on what your disability is, some tasks require more effort. And then there's also the forks, which make it harder for you to reach for more spoons. And then there's also knives, which are kind of like spoons, but a lot less effective. So if we talk about deaf people, um, or people who have very bad hearing, um, so we can see that the internet is actually quite comprehensible as text and images. So there's really no um, barrier. Subtitles also exist for many videos. If it's uh, broadcast broadcasted in U.S. American TV, then there's actually a requirement that subtitles exist. Um, there are also automatically generated subtitles, but these should only be considered as a starting point for creating uh, manually curated uh, subtitles. Um, because there are false positives with regard to speech recognition. And I want to add like a very big footnote for subtitles. Because people who have been deaf for life, um, for them it is not natural to understand text-based language. Uh, that's why in many cases it's also necessary to see um, the, the um, sign language um, of, of the content. Yes, so basically sign language is the mother tongue and not text-based language. And it would be good to have sign language for videos to improve uh, accessibility. There's also blind people or people with bad sight. There are different forms. Some people are really bad at focusing on text or te focusing in general. Some people are really bad with different colors, with seeing different colors. Text on the internet is relatively well understandable. Podcasts are awesome because these are a lot more pleasant to consume than texts. And there are also browser add-ons that increase the contrast or in exchange the fonts so that they are easier to read. And these tools really make it a lot easier to consume text. Something that I, I'm really, I really care about is image descriptions and audio descriptions because these are a really rare thing. So an audio description means that a visual, the visual content of a video will be will will exp, will be explained by a speaker, so that people who cannot see the video also understand what is being talked about. And a special category that is very problematic for blind people is games, because 
many games require people to actually see um, the game pieces. At least there are filters for people who are uh, colorblind. We have the category of motor motoric impairments. The internet helps because it works in their own apartment. And websites that require less interactions are are really pleasant or rather pleasant to use and this is one of the many accessibility features that is being optimized anyway um, sometimes uh, yeah some things are easier to reach with for example just like three clicks uh, but then there's also games, and there are, is some progress. For instance, there is the Xbox Adaptive Controller. And it enables people with motoric impairments to play these games. And there are also some good options for increased accessibility. But there are still many games that are very proud to be exclusive for example the dark souls series which i find very problematic there are many people who want to explore those worlds and it's very fun and i think it's really wrong I think it's very wrong to require of everyone to be to have high motor skills to play these games. There are also cognitive disabilities, so disabilities that decrease the ability of the brain, and something that is really growing and becoming more and more problematic are dark patterns. Dark patterns. Yeah, and dark patterns are unfortunately becoming more and more of a standard or a common sight in the web. And for us regular people, it's just annoying, but for people with uh, disabilities, this is extremely difficult. And for instance, a cookie banner, they, they show you a very big button. Um, and yeah, it makes it really, really difficult to um, reject those cookies, especially for disabled people. And this is a really good example of a dark pattern. Because, yeah, so this is all about giving the user a choice and enticing the user to make a choice that is actually not in the interest of the user. But if you have but if you have a cognitive impairment, then it's more likely that you fall for these dark, dark patterns and make decisions against your own benefit. And and another aspect is uh, easy language or simple language. This is language without uh, foreign words, without te technical words, and yeah, common words. And inform and it's written in such a way that information is presented in common, in, in redundant fashion. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to talk about the perspective of. Uh, um, now we're talking about this perspective of uh, more psychological impairments. Uh, it uh, can have influences on depression, on um, fear situations, on um, on um, on eating disorders, and on uh, maybe other things. 
um, they can uh, make you do things that you really actually don't even want to do and or maybe don't have fun with. Um, they sometimes um, um, often they often don't really allow you to um, completely freely decide um, if if you want to be exposed to these things, such as also cyber mobbing. All right. So let's uh, get to a more uh, fun and easy thing uh, to relax. This is a, a shark that maybe looks a bit like a dog because the internet is not just evil uh, if you have uh, psychological disorders. It uh, can also be uh, very uh, interesting and good uh, to find a communities that uh, have lots of people that are very similar to oneself. And I have found a, a great uh, circle of friends on the internet and also especially in the chaos environment that um, are somewhat similar to myself and my, have my issues. And um, they also give lots of marginalized uh, groups a platform to represent themselves and feel normalized. And the YouTube algorithm, as broken as it is, is not really... Um, someone who actively decides, oh, this person has some sort of disorder, so I, I don't want to show this to anyone. But you, you can just upload, and if it's clicked, peop and if people click on it, then, then it's viewed. The, the way one can be seen and uh, feel more normal, uh, even inside and outside of bubbles, that is that these communities can give give one and that is something that really feels well and um, also actually prevents that uh, these issues can get developed further and uh, in, in a psychological direction. And now let's get uh, to some constructive ideas. So what, what could end users do to improve the internet? So what could you do? Keep online spaces alive. This is something that um, the internet and also the world really made uh, a lot more uh, accessible. And that is something that we should keep alive. Be informed, be, uh, keep, give, give attention, follow, follow the activists. And um, they, there are lots of people that uh, are, the, the people themselves know the most what they need. And um, to, to obtain this information about what could be done. There, there are lots of these activists that really have um, good content and also be, be an ally. And um, we, as we, we have in German, Germany the law that the um, dignity of uh, humans is um, unimpeachable. And uh, that also applies to everyone, including the impaired. And uh, there are still, in many places in Germany, with bureaucracy, with uh, the train system, in the, the everyday jobs, there are way too many not even necessary um, barriers for many people. But also have some understanding that, yeah, not everybody with impairments uh, wants to actively fight this fight. And uh, yeah, many people with impairments often have um, less less uh, things they can do, and they have to be more sparing. And I, uh, for example, also really appreciate if people mark sarcasm, irony, and jokes in in tweets and such things, because it's much easier to understand. Just the the slash s for sarcasm, for example. Something else that you can do that um, will only cost you two to five minutes per picture is uh, adding image text. Texts on images will replace image uh, information that only exists visually and ideally are as short as possible. Um, dis image descriptions that um, apply some opinion on the picture are not that great. They should be entirely descriptive, such as like with a comic. You shouldn't explain the visual joke, but only just explain all the base information from the picture that we need to understand the joke ourselves. So another thing that uh, was mentioned to me, if you actually write um, descriptions on the image, use the same language as the content. Maybe you can even translate it in some cases, because not everywhere streams will automatically um, switch to the right language. 
and uh, especially also screen readers and having the screen reader read a different language and having it switched over for one image is a, a difficult thing. So I have another XKCD comic here that uh, I have translated for this German talk. So I will write comic in the first line. Then text, colon. Uh, a network tries to be a solution for everything, basically a Walmart of the social media. Then, below that, there is a, an image that I call a comic panel. It's a sketch of a room with shelves, and there's a stick man that is holding a can and has a speech bubble that says, hey, what an accident that I am meeting you here. And then I wrote second figure with um, messy hair, which I only wrote because I don't know anything else about them. They have a speech bubble. Oh, hey, yeah. How's it going? And then maybe the the hair wasn't really necessary to understand the comic, but it is there, so I try to describe it. Describe it. So this is of course a bit a thing of discussion and opinion, but uh, describing a bit is always better than describing nothing. And then lastly, there's a second text below the panel, and it says. If, if, if it's forced to become the Walmart of social media. Uh, this comic is a bit difficult because the, the sentence is separated between above the panel and below the panel. And I'm not perfectly sure how I would do this. Maybe one could uh, put those together in the description, but I try to be as exact as possible. So the next thing that uh, much too many social media networks don't do right, but uh, is something that can be done, is use uh, links that speak for themselves. Links are often not great for screen readers, because if uh, random numbers and letters are in, in the link, then it's really, 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 really hard to, to listen to. And it's also very important that the link is replaced with the text for that reason. And the text then accurately describes the content of the link. Like if you have a screen reader and you read across a page with a lot of links and it reads you the links, then if the links are self-explanatory, then you understand what is linked. So if you maybe have like a page with lots of videos of cats, then you shouldn't write just down the cat in the, the, the URL in the in the text and also not a click here with the link, but ideal ideally just use the, the descriptive text like page with great cat videos and link that sentence a part of the sentence. Content notes. So content notes are sometimes also called content warnings. They can help people um, use, make informed decisions on what kinds of content they want to consume. So this is maybe about hidden topics that people don't really expect in an article and uh, to just mention those ahead of time. The deta details, don't really need to get into that, but maybe uh, the, if um, a, a content is about uh, screens and uh, the, the Linux kernel is uh, mentioned, then this could be a content note. These are, of course, topics that I would not really consider problematic. And it's always uh, a question of uh, discussion what exactly um, should be mentioned and what shouldn't, because the feature is usually meant uh, to be used to help people that have uh, traumatic experiences with certain topics. So uh, I think this is much more important for any topic that uh, is associated with a common trauma. And uh, the C3RC, uh, at some point, IOC had a list of content notes for speakers that uh, should be considered. OK, let's do a little diversion. Street Complete is a great app that with which you can help uh, adding to OpenStreetMap data. It's basically Pokemon Go, but useful. You walk around the world and you um, add data to a street that is not tagged uh, sufficiently. And you can add a lot more information that um, can be very useful for blind people, people with hearing uh, impairments and stuff, such. And that is also one example for things that developers can do. 
to um, provide more accessibility. Uh, but for now, let's uh, do. Um, so at some point, I was uh, grocery shopping, but um, there is a lot of uh, stimulus situation there that can often happen, from warmth, from respect, with from people without respect, from lots of screens with animations, and uh, crazy images in various places uh, on on products. And um, that is very, very overwhelming. And at some point, I just asked somebody from the from the store if they can just calm things down when I'm there, or could you maybe introduce an hour of calm shopping? But the people from the shop told me that they can't even regulate the volume of the, the cashier register systems. And so, wait, like they could maybe buy a new one. But I thought that maybe wouldn't the store, is it really that much important that the customers are continuously um, influenced with ads? Then is that more important than me being able to uh, pleasurely <laughs> uh, buy things? And uh, that's why I don't really buy at Kaufland anymore. And of course, this is a, a systematic problem. And that's why the developers have a lot of power here. So the system has made all the decisions for the people working at the grocery store. And there was no flexibility to provide some service to us as a customer. And that's, of course, a bad system. So there's a single point of failure here that has been created that could actually easily be avoided if, for example, there was the ability to adjust the volume. And uh, if there were alternatives as well. Because every single thing can very quickly uh, become a barrier that has to be um, uh, circumvented. Some people really can't work with text chats. Some people really can't uh, call. So ideally, if you have a great support, you have both text chat and calls. Personally, I really like self-service checkout registers. But uh, for some other people, that can be really difficult to use. So both self-service and uh, other people's service, uh, having both really provides alternatives and makes the experience for everyone uh, more barrier free. Let's get back to video games. Um, so, uh, an adjustable difficulty is um, great. You can often have many balancing variables that can be opened up to the user, such as have more health, slow down the game, add more double jumps, stuff like that. Celeste has a great, great example uh, for that. And uh, lots of these variables were shown in this example. Um, there are also alternative ways to, to game um, that can be provided. For example, some some games like Dirt Rally, many of them can be played both as an arcade game or as a simulation game. In um, Super Mario Odyssey, there are two very different um, game modes that are much more accessible and um, are better just from, from the game concept and easier to play. Then, um, if and then maybe also use established standards like uh, more more distinguishable uh, colors and audio descriptions, for example. There are also some more um, requests here that we have. Um, I think I'm gonna have to hurry up here. And um, Hearthstone, the game Hearthstone. There is a very patient community that creates uh, extensions for the game, but um, the, this community always has to decompile um, the newest version of the game to develop the community extensions. And but that also requires the support, or at least the acceptance by the software publishers. Otherwise, um, the development can't continue. Some advice for web developers. Um, yeah, I'm, I don't have enough time, unfortunately. 
accessibility guide there of mine. But uh, I have an accessibility guide yeah, here that is linked on my slides. Um, you can use it as yeah to, to know what to do and to summarize web accessibility is improving and there are more tools that improve the contrast and the degree of the awareness is also increasing that there are people with disabilities on the internet and also image descriptions are really really helpful so this is also useful if, for search engines so basically accessibility is beneficial for everyone and please do not implement dark patterns they are bad for everyone and as CCC, as the CCC, uh, we say um, really smart, especially proprietary softwares are causing a lot of problems. Okay, I am better last. And you can contact me if you have any further questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Peter Lars. This is a very big topic, but uh, also uh, I'm very thankful that you took the time to talk about this and uh, told us about this. Thank you. Okay, let's get to the first question. So if there's a statistic that I already have entirely described in, within the text, do I also need to add a description to the image itself? Yeah, um, that's a good point. Sometimes sometimes an image basically augments an already complex text. If, if that is the case, then just write as the image description statistic as described in the text. You don't need to write it a second time. Ah, all right, thanks. Then I have another question from myself. So you mentioned the content nodes. Is there a format that should be used? There is a feature in Mastodon with a specific field for this. And this is really good. If you write it in there, that's that's really helpful. But otherwise, you can all, always have like a small text block that you keep free for specifically that. But it's, yeah, but these content warrants are not that established yet, so there are not really any standards yet. Ah, okay, thanks. Then here's another great question. Are there good tools that help you um, uh, estimate the accessibility of websites? Yes, there are automatic tools. A simple hack is to look at the website without CSS because that's like what people who use screen readers see. Um, uh, there's also a tool, but I don't really remember the name of it. I'm trying to... Yeah, okay, the tool is linked in the slides. Yeah, you might there. add that to the notes. Okay, great. So, what is the legal situation with dark patterns regarding um, the limitations of some people, regardless of um, the GDPR and cookie laws and stuff like that? Are there laws regarding that? As far as I know, um, so many websites are outside of the uh, general equal treatment law. So it's not really, yeah, so there doesn't seem to be laws. But the new 
German government plans that there will be more requirements for better accessibility in the future. And I can very well imagine that dark patterns will be no longer legal. Some dark patterns could also be uh, be no longer legal because of um, unfair competition. So there are also like cases where there's uh, terms of use with some sections that actually don't make sense legally, but people just write stuff in there anyway. All right, thank you. So the next question is, what about um, using umlauts in combination with screen readers? Does, for example, the umlaut U, uh, U work, or should one write UE alternatively? If it's tagged in the right language, then and the screen reader also supports umlauts, then the then the U's and and the other umlauts will be uh, read aloud correctly. Yeah. Okay. Are there um, low effort ways uh, to uh, and offers for people with dementia on the internet, or is that not really a reasonable use case? I have um, interacted with a firma recently, firm recently, a company recently, who focused uh, on this problem, but spontaneously I can't really say anything about this. Ah, okay, thank you. So, how well can screen readers work with um, gender just? and fair language. Um, my favorite option is to use uh, so my favorite way of doing it is to use the German neutral masculine version which you can also abbreviate but um, gender formulations are a bit difficult. And, and I prefer to use the underscore because it is um, pronounced as a small pause by the text to speech programs. Ah, okay. Good to know. Thanks. So, one more translation here. Um, in the German text language, or the DGS, is generally a um, change of text is, is the, for text that um, have some copyright on them. Um, do you usually ask them before? Um, creative Commons licenses are really helpful here. Um, so Creative Commons, um, by and non-commercial, as you can see on my slides. But if there is a non-derivative license, then you have to theoretically ask the authors if you may adapt the things. So if, if you want to add like an image description to a non-derivative work, then you really have to ask the original offer. But I also think it's ridiculous if artists sue you because you added an image description. I don't think that, was, that, that this will happen. Is there an overview about over uh, accessibility dark patterns to avoid? There was a talk uh, at DVOC about dark patterns, and there were 
there were yeah there were several dark patterns that were presented that are in general bad there are also um anti patterns in addition to bad uh, dark patterns but i don't quite remember any examples yeah okay ah okay I think that's one more question that uh, is currently appearing in the pad, but we are breaking the talk off here. So uh, you listed your Twitter handle here, I think. So um, that is probably also a place where people can contact you. Um, yeah, I'm also on Mastodon, on Chaos Social, or uh, on Solitude, maybe also. That is probably where I'm also going to be in the Quiet Cube. That, would, that is uh, both available from the world and from the hub. Thank you for your attention, also from the translation booth. You just heard the talk, State of the Accessibility, by Betalas. It was translated by Jörn and Oscar. If you have feedback for us, please use the hashtag C3Lingo. Thank you and goodbye.